Matthew 28, and Matthew chapter 9. Uh, being on Labor Day, I thought we'd talk about uh, labor, uh, Christian labor. Uh, I quoted that verse a while ago in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, um, I think it's 15, verse 58, where it says, uh, um, Wherefore, my beloved, uh, be, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, right? Because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so the Bible does talk about our labor for the Lord, that we should be laboring for Him, uh, putting some effort into serving Him. So look at uh, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, and uh, look at verse number 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth the laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. Ask God that you would uh, bless the reading of the scripture this morning, the preaching from the Bible today. May it encourage, challenge, and help each one here today and each one that's listening. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, now, he says there in chapter 9, he said, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the labors are few. And so we should pray that the Lord would send labors into the harvest. And um, it says in verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Uh, the Lord's moved with compassion on them because the Bible said there he saw them. He looked upon them and he saw them. Uh, I heard a story of the day, I read a story of the day about D.L. Moody and there was two preachers that uh, um, had um, visited him and they wanted to know the secret of uh, his evangelistic efforts. That is, uh, D.L. Moody uh, was able to win a lot of people to the Lord uh, through his preaching ministry and also through his personal witnessing. And um, they asked him, uh, they said, well, what is the secret of your ability to win these people to Christ? And uh, so they were up in a hotel someplace, several stories up, looking over Chicago. And so uh, Moody said, look out the window. What do you see? And somebody said, well, I see... Um, I see a lot of buildings and a lot of businesses and I see a lot of uh, um, activity going on out there. And he said, what do you see? That other preachers, preachers said, well, I see basically the same thing, you know. He said, I see, see, the, pond, I see the lake over there, I see the park over there, I see this over there, and I see a bunch of people walking around. And uh, Moody said, well, I see something different. And uh, they said, what do you see? He said, I see souls walking around down there lost without Christ. He said, that's what I see. I see souls. And so the idea is, with Moody was, that uh, his thing was he saw people as souls. He didn't see things. He saw souls. And so he had compassion on them because he saw them as that. He saw them as an eternal soul that's going to spend eternity someplace, heaven or hell. And he wanted to do something about it. And we should have that same uh, viewpoint, that same perspective on people. But many times we get so caught up in the world that we don't even see. We can't see the we can't see the forest for the trees, or the trees of the forest, or the souls for uh, just the multitudes of riffraff and people we see out in the world. But we need to see souls. Amen. Amen. Now, um, look at uh, Matthew 28, and here in Matthew 28 is called the, uh, of course, the Great Commission, and it says there in uh, verse number 16, it said. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain, where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, of course the doubter was probably Thomas, and Thomas may have infected a few others, you know, with doubts and things like that. But when you see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who had died on the cross, um, meet with you after he's been crucified on the cross, uh, there shouldn't be any doubts after that, Amen. That should, that should resolve all doubts. But verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying this, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Now go to the book of Luke, chapter 24. And here is another uh, description of uh, the Lord's uh, great commission here. Look at Luke chapter 24. And notice what he says over here. Now, um, he, he's speaking to the disciples, and he's telling them these things. And Matthew records part of it. Luke report, re records another part of it. You put them together, and you have the entire statements. But look here at um, Luke 24. And look at verse number 20, I'm sorry, verse 46. And he said unto them, that thus it is written, that and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And notice verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Um, so here, um, I'll, I'll take this back, what I just said there. Uh, Luke 24 is a different scene as we read this. Uh, in Matthew 28, uh, he's ascending to heaven. Um, and here, uh, it appears that he's telling them to go wait. So there may be a time difference here. But regardless of that, uh, I want you to know what he said here. I want you to go out, he said, and preach, preach repentance and remission of sins to the people. They need to repent, and they need to receive the remission of sins through faith. There's two things in the Bible that bring about remission of sin. One is repentance, the other is faith. Yeah. And they go hand in hand. Right. Nothing else in the Bible leads to remission of sins or forgiveness of sins other than repentance and faith. Baptism has nothing to do with your sins being forgiven. Amen. Everywhere in the Bible, it's repentance and faith. Right. That brings about the remission of sins. So anyway... I want to talk today about, and you know, we were talking about, we sang that song, we're going to work till Jesus comes. Uh, we're talking about the Great Commission to uh, get the gospel out and spread the word of God. So we're going to talk about uh, the Bible's plan of salvation. What are we supposed to be saying? What are we supposed to be telling people? Now, the message is basically the same. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Right. Uh, it's the fact that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, the Bible says, and he rose again the third day for our justification. That's what the Bible teaches. And so we preach that message. But um, somebody can believe that message with their head and never get saved because there was never really any conviction. There was never any Holy Spirit conviction. There was never any repentant attitude. Uh, there was never any real genuine faith uh, in the Lord. Many people say a prayer, and uh, sometimes they get saved, and sometimes it's meaningless because they never truly accepted Christ as their Savior. Um, and you say, how do you know the difference? Well, that's something for you to figure out. Right. That's for you to figure out. I can't tell you. I can't tell you if you were sincere when you got saved. I can't tell you if you were sincere when you prayed and asked the Lord to save you. I can't know. I don't know how sincere your faith was. Um, that's between you and the Lord to figure that out. But uh, you should know if you're saved or not. And if you're doubting your salvation, you should get assurance of your salvation and make sure that you are saved. But now we're going to talk about the Bible's plan of salvation. This is just a simple way of presenting the gospel. Uh, there's different ways of doing it. People might do it a different way, but this is just something that uh, over the years I've come up with that uh, works for me to be able to uh, share the gospel, preach the gospel, pro proclaim the gospel to somebody, or witness to them. Uh, on one page is the Bible's plan of salvation, and it says outline. On the other side is just simply the Bible's plan of salvation. And uh, what was on the side that says the Bible's plan of salvation is uh, something that I wrote for my father-in-law's funeral uh, and for the people that were attending it uh, because uh, he had gotten saved uh, in the hospital before he passed away. And uh, then uh, I had something, I think I had written him a letter uh, explaining salvation at one point. And I took that and I uh, wrote this out and I put it in a tract form and left it for everyone at that particular funeral. And I believe there's enough there if you read that and believed it, and the Holy Spirit's dead in your heart, you can get saved. Uh, but that's just a, that's like a little gospel track right there. But it's based on the other page, which is the outline, which is the sermon, if you will. And let me say this. Uh, here's the Bible's plan of salvation. And again, there's no plan that saves you, okay? 
Some people get hung up on that and say, well, you know, uh, you know, there's no plan that saves you. I understand that, but there is a plan or a method that we can go through to show somebody what you need to do to be saved and how to get saved. That's right. And uh, so uh, uh, salvation is not in a plan. It's in the man. Amen? Right, right. The man, Jesus Christ. Amen. But uh, there's nothing wrong with having something organized because if you don't, I mean, I mean you can witness to somebody off the top of your head, uh, just right off of your heart. That happens. That works. That's perfect. Um, that's good. But there's sometimes that you get a brain fog or a brain freeze or something. You don't know where you're at and where to go. And, and uh, so this is just something to help you uh, get it organized in your own mind how that you can witness to somebody. And uh, you can use this thing here. You can put it in your Bible um, or wherever. Uh, but eventually, if you go through this thing and just look at it and, and uh, just kind of study over it, eventually you're going to get this stuff in you so that you'll, you won't even need this. But there's some times, again, that you may need it because, hey, when you get old, you don't have to. You start forgetting things. <laughs> An old preacher told me, he said, he said, write all your notes down, save all your sermons that you've preached, because when you get older, you may not remember any of them. <laughs> so you're going to have to have some jog your memory and say, oh, that's that sermon. There it is, right? So write it all down and save it because you may need it when you start getting Alzheimer's as a preacher. Amen? Amen. Um, and, but anyway, uh, so let me say this. For a person to go to heaven, of course, they must be saved. No matter what denomination or religion or church you belong to, if you're going to go to heaven, you've got to be saved. That's a Bible word. <clears throat> that word saved is all through the Bible. It's all through the New Testament. And so we talk about being saved. Uh, and when some people you talk to, uh, uh, they may not even know what that word means. Right. Saved. What does saved mean? Well, saved means that God forgives your sins so you don't have to go to hell. And God gives you eternal life and his righteousness so you can go to heaven when you die. Pretty simple. Well, salvation, Christ died for you so you don't have to go to hell. He rose again so you can go to heaven. That's the gospel. Amen. And so, anyway, but now here's the details of it. Uh, for a person to go to heaven, they've got to be saved. In order to be saved, number one, you must realize that you're a sinner. You must realize that you are a sinner. Um, the Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. And why is there none righteous? The next verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So everyone is a sinner. Uh, you don't have to be uh, you know, the worst criminal uh, in the cell block to be a sinner. Everybody's a sinner, amen? The Bible said that if you uh, uh, offend a, a God and break one point of one law, you've sinned against God. Uh, to God, sin is a, uh, is a terrible, horrible thing. Uh, sin is a damning thing. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. Uh, so sin is serious to God. And uh, sin needs to be serious to you. And if, if sin is not serious to you, then I, sin I sincerely doubt that you are saved or could get saved unless you realize that you're a sinner. What's a sinner? He's someone who's broken God's law. Uh, what's God's law? Everybody knows the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Have you ever put anything before God? Yes? Okay, you're a sinner. Uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Have you ever used God's name as a cuss word? Okay, then you're a sinner. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Have you ever done that? It's not really. Have you ever done it in your mind or your heart? Okay, you're a sinner. Uh, thou shalt not uh, commit murder. Thou shalt not kill. Have you ever killed anybody? Have you ever murdered anybody? So I haven't really done it in the flesh. Well, the Bible said if you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder in the sight of God. So you're a sinner. Amen? The uh, Bible says don't bear false witness. Have you ever told a lie? Makes you a sinner. So it's not that you're this, you know, you're not the worst sinner on the cell block. You're, you're just a sinner because you've sinned against God. And if you sin against God, even one sin uh, is going to make you a sinner. But I'll bet you've committed more than one. So you're a sinner, amen? A sinner's one who's committed sin. And, uh, and there's none righteous. Well, uh, a person that's righteous is someone who's not a sinner. Uh, Jesus Christ is called Jesus Christ the righteous. You know why? Because he wasn't a sinner. Amen. He wasn't a sinner. But there is none righteous. No, not one. There's nobody that's right with God based on his own good works, his own good character, his own, uh, his own merits or whatever. There's nobody righteous 
in and of himself uh, because we're all sinners. And that's what he said. There's none righteous. No, not one. So the problem with a lot of people is they're self-righteous. They think they're good enough to get to heaven. Let me say this. If you think you're good enough to get to heaven, don't judge me because you're better than I am. Right. Because I don't think I'm good enough to get to heaven. You got people that say, well, you preach this way, you preach that way, and you, you love, just love to condemn people. Well, no. I don't like to condemn people. You're already condemned according to the Bible. Right. If, you, if you're rejecting Christ, Jesus said you're condemned already. Uh, so uh, and at, at one point before I became a Christian, I was condemned. I was lost. I was unsaved. And I was not righteous because there's none righteous, no, not one. Why? Because I had sinned. I'd broken God's laws. And I fell short and came short of the glory of God. And therefore, I'm a sinner. And uh, again, I don't think that I'm good enough to get to heaven, but if you think you're good enough to get to heaven, then you're better than I am. Um, you must realize that you're a sinner. And then let me say, secondly, you have to realize that because of your sin that you'll be eternally lost. You'll be eternally lost because of your sin. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. That's pretty clear. The wages of sin is death. That's about five or six words. One syllable. The wages of sin is death. Because I can't understand the Bible. You can't understand one syllable words. You probably go to college too, don't you? I mean, you probably went to high school at some place. But you can't understand one syllable of words. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. What don't you understand about that? The wages of sin is death. Well, what's a wage? A wage is something that you earn. And so if you are working your way to heaven, the wages you're going to get is death. Why? Because the wage of sin is death and you're a sinner and you've committed sin. And because you're a sinner who's committed sin, you've earned death. Not life. You've earned death. You've earned condemnation. You've earned judgment. You've earned damnation. You've earned hell. Why? Because the wage of sin is death. A wage is something that you deserve. And if you want to, if you want to go stand before God and say, God, give me what I deserve, that's a huge mistake. Because we all deserve God's judgment. What we want is mercy. We don't want God's justice. We don't want his judgment. We want mercy. Amen? Amen. And uh, you're going to have to realize you're a sinner and also realize that you are uh, eternally lost without hope and without God in this world and in eternity if you don't get saved. Uh, Revelation 21 verse 8 said, The fearful and the unbelieving were cast into the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So the Bible says that those who die without believing in Christ and trusting him as their Savior, those who die and don't get born again and get their name written in the Lamb's book of life, will one day face judgment and spend eternity away from God, separated, isolated, in a place called hell and the lake of fire. Uh, that's a terrible place to go. Um, so you have to realize you're a sinner. You have to realize that because of your sin, you're going to be eternally lost. And they have to realize, number three, that um, even though you're a sinner who's eternally lost, yet God loves you and wants you to be saved. God doesn't hate you in the sense that he's emotionally upset with you and wants to damn your soul to hell because he hates your stinking guts. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the hatred that God has for you. Uh, God hates sin, and his hatred against sin is going to be felt by you unless you somehow get rid of your sins. And the only way to do that is what God did. God did it for you. He offers you the forgiveness of sins. He wants you to be saved, so he provided a way out. He knows you're a sinner. He knows you're going to sin. He knows you're eternally lost. He knows you'll be damned unless he does something. And so he does something. And in the New Testament, he sends his son. Number three, you have to realize that God loved you and wants you to be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so if you want to have everlasting life instead of being eternally damned, 
uh, you're going to have to trust Jesus Christ and believe in him for what he did for you. And again, God sent his son to die for you in your place so that you could be saved by faith in him because he loved the world. So I did it. Uh, people say, well, you know, the God you preach is a God of hate. Let me read that verse again. For God so loved the world. Amen. One syllable words that, that, that disagrees with whom I, whoever says God hates us. Why are you preaching such a hate, hate-filled hate religion with a God who hates? Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what the Lord says. Um, 1 John 4, 10 is a great verse. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us right. and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. Propitiation is, a, I got the note there, it's a sacrificial payment. Right. Propitiation is a, a sacrificial payment that satisfies the demands of the law. That's the law demands your death. You've sinned against God. The wage of sin is death in God's economy. And so in the in God's uh, system of government, the wage of sin is death, and the law demands the death of the sinner. And so you're going to have to die for your sin. You say, well, um, you know, I haven't done that much bad stuff. Well, you have to recognize how holy God is. God is holy. That's a concept many people don't understand. God is so holy that he can't, he cannot abide at sin in his presence. He can't even look upon sin. Right. He so can't look upon sin. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and became sin for us at that moment, God couldn't even look at his own son and forsook him. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was bearing the sins of the world. Bearing your sins and mine. And God said, I can't look upon that. I'm too holy to look at that. Because he's the creator, he's perfect, and he's holy. Um, so again, sin to God is a heinous thing. So no matter what kind of sin it is, no matter what degree the sin is, no matter what the sin is, no matter how, how many sins there are. It only takes one sin, but the fact is, we all commit more than one sin in our lifetime. Um, now, you have to realize that God loves you and wants you to be saved. The Bible said in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. So if you decide to go to hell, you go against the will of God. It's not God's will that you should go to hell. It's not God's will that you should perish. That's why he sent his son. But that all should come to repentance. He wants you to come to repentance. And um, let me say this. You have to come to God with a repentant attitude or you'll never be saved. Right. You can't come to God with a rebellious attitude. You have to come with a repentant attitude. You can't come with a superior attitude or a, 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 a sense of entitlement that God owes you salvation, you have to come to God with a submissive spirit, a, a humbled heart before God. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, as we preach the word and tell the gospel story, the Holy Spirit of God starts working on people's hearts and their consciences and their minds. And they start, they, they start to feel the weight of their sin. And they start to feel... Uh, the burden of their guilt. And uh, that leads to repentance. The Bible says in one place, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. When God shows you the truth about yourself and makes you feel your sinful condition and feel the burden of your sin and fear the judgment of God, that's the goodness of God trying to save you. Right. Getting you to a place in your life where you will come to Christ to be saved. He says, You'll never come to Christ to be saved by faith until, first of all, you've repented. To repent simply means to come to God recognizing, acknowledging, and admitting that, God, you're right and I'm wrong. I'm a sinner and you're holy. And there's nothing I can do to save myself. Now, again, we're all sinners. We're all eternally lost in our sin if we haven't been saved. And a person has to realize, the lost person has to realize that God did love them and does want them to be saved. And then, number four, they say this, you have to realize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. 
You've got to realize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. Not only did God love you, not only does God want you to be saved, but you have to understand that Christ paid for your sins. Right. It's not just, well, I know that God loves me, therefore I'm okay. No. You're not okay just because God loves you. You've got to be saved. You've got to admit your guilt. You've got to humble yourself before God. You've got to turn towards God in repentance and faith to be saved. And one thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to acknowledge, admit, and agree with God that there's not a thing in this world you can do to save yourself. Uh, Jesus Christ paid for your sins. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Um, Romans 5.8 says this, Christ died for us. And when he died for us, that means he died uh, on our behalf. He died in our stead. He died in our place. He died for us and that he took the place on the cross and died the death of a sinner that we should have died. Right. But God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, what Christ did, he died for us on the cross. Christ died the death of a sinner so we wouldn't have to. He fulfilled the law. When he came, he lived the perfect sinless life. Uh, he never had a, had, a, had a sinful thought, never committed a sinful deed, uh, never had a sinful attitude. He was perfect. And he lived and he fulfilled everything the law required of a person. You know, if, you could, if, if in the Old Testament you could have kept every law that God set out, then you could be saved because you'd be perfectly righteous. But the law was never meant to save anybody because the law shows us we're sinners. The Bible said one place, by the, knowledge, by, 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 the, by, the, uh, by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. We went over that in the first point. What is that? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't cuss, right? Uh, don't put anything before God. All those are sins. And uh, because of that, we're sinners. And uh, so we know we're sinners. And we deserve death for our sin. But somebody paid the price for us. That was Jesus Christ. He died in our place. And it says here Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. To die for our sins, but he died uh, because of our sin. And he died to pay for our sins. Uh, Colossians 1.14 says this, that in Christ we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. And it's because of his grace. Uh, redemption is uh, God, redemption is when you buy something back. In the old days, you would uh, finish your Coke bottle, your Dr. Pepper bottle, your Sprite bottle, whatever, right? You'd save them. You might even go down the road and collect them, pick them up. You take them to the store, they give you a nickel for every bottle. Right. That was being, that was, you were redeeming your bottle. I found this bottle. I have some bottles. I don't need them anymore. Oh my God, I'm going to give it to you. And he's going to give you a nickel for every bottle. I remember doing that just to get me another drink. Amen. Right. When I was a kid, right? How many did that? Um, and so what are they, they're redeeming that bottle. When they redeem that bottle, you know what they're doing? The Coke people and the Dr. Pepper people and the Seven up people, whatever, they want those bottles back. Right. So they're going to pay to get those bottles back. I've got the bottle. You want it back? You're going to give me a nickel. <laughs> right? That's okay. Coke says, okay, we're going to give you a nickel for that bottle. And the guy at the store, on the behalf of Coke, Cola, or whatever, gives you a nickel for your bottle. And they buy that bottle back. You know what God did? God bought you back right. from the devil's market. You were lost. You were in sin. Uh, and back in the garden, Adam and Eve literally walked away from God and became lost. And everybody since then had been born sinners who were lost. And God wants to get his lost bottles back. And that's you, lost souls. He wants you back. So to get you back, what's he going to do? He's going to pay to get you back. He's going to redeem you. How's he going to do it? And whom we have redemption through his blood. Amen. The forgiveness of sins. So we get our sins forgiven, we get bought back by God and redeemed. Why? By, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he paid for our sins and he paid to get us back. So you've got to realize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins to get you back. He didn't do anything. And then also you have to realize this. There's people that realize that they're a sinner. There's people that realize that they're eternally lost. There's people that realize that God loved them and wants them to be saved. There's people who realize that Jesus Christ paid for their sins. 
but they still are holding on thinking that they've got to do something to help out. And they've got to do good works to be saved. They, they'll say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me, but I still believe I've got to live it to get to heaven. I believe that Jesus died for me, paid for my sins on the cross, but I've still got to belong to the right church to be saved. I've still got to live right to be saved. And that's not true. They're counting on their works to save them. They're counting on Christ and their works, and you can't count on both. Salvation's in Christ alone. So good works don't save. Only the work that Jesus did saves. So I, I say this. Our good works don't save, but his good work does save. So we've got to trust him, not our works. So the Bible says this. And I gave you a couple of verses there. Ephesians 2, 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Prior to that, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. And again, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, if you could get to heaven, wouldn't you brag about it? Nobody's going to boast in the presence of God. Nobody's going to boast in the presence of Jesus Christ. One preacher said nobody's going to strut their way into heaven. Because why? Because we're sinners. We have to humble ourselves. We can't come in there self-righteous, holier than thou, thinking that we earned it. Um, I read, I read uh, something... Uh, uh, years ago, and I still remember, where uh, uh, the mayor of New York City at the time uh, gave $50 billion to some uh, uh, organization that, uh, and some cause he was for. And he said this to the news reporter. It's in the newspaper. You can still read it. He said, if anybody's going to heaven, it's me. Wow. I'm not even stopping to be, in, to be inquired of at the gate. If anybody's in a place in heaven, I've done it. Mm. Well, he's bragging. He's bragging that he could buy his way into heaven. Right? Well, you can't do that. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't earn your way into heaven. You're not good enough to go to heaven. Well, and somebody says, well, who are you to say that? Somebody that's not good enough to get to heaven on his own. That's, who I'm, that's who's saying that, me. I'm not good enough, neither are you. Like I said a while ago, if you're good enough to get to heaven on your own, you're better than I am. Um, so Christ paid for our sins, but your good works don't save. Titus uh, 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Now look at this. Somebody says, Well, I still think I need to do this and do that, whatever, to be saved. Well, look at this again. Look at Ephesians 2 now. Just not of works. Look at Titus 3.5. Not by works. Amen. You get that? No works. It's not by works. It's not of works. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. All right? But there's a lot of religious people that believe that they can get there if they'll do what their religion says. No, Christ died for your sins. He paid the sin debt. His work saves. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. All right? So, number six. Look at this here. Um, so, a person has to realize they're a sinner. Most people do. A person has to realize that they're eternally lost. Most religious people understand that. You have to realize that God loved you and wants you to be saved. Most people in church realize that. You have to realize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross. Most people realize that. Number five, you've got to realize that your good works don't save and do not contribute to your salvation. Right. Now there's where we hit a bump with some people. You'll ask them, well, are you saved? Well, I hope I am. You going to heaven when you die? I hope I am. How come you don't know? The Bible says you can know in 1 John 5.13. It says you can know that you're saved and have eternal life. Why don't you know? I'll tell you why you don't know. Because you're counting on your works to get you there or help you get into heaven. It's a funny thing. Uh, people who are counting on their works to go to heaven, people who want to go to heaven, that are counting on their works to go to heaven, never know for sure if they're going to heaven. Wow. And here's me and people like mine and like faith here that we're not trusting anything we've ever done or ever will do to get us to heaven. That's right. Amen. Amen. And we know we're going. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How, how does that work? Well, because we're trusting his work and not ours. Right. See? You trust in your own works, you're always going to doubt your salvation. You trust in Christ's work, you'll have assurance of salvation. Amen. That's for sure. uh, you need to quit looking at yourself and looking to Christ. Amen. And then number six here. Um, 
So how, do a, how does a person accept Christ as Savior? Somebody asked me the other day, he said, you said all these things, how does a person actually accept Jesus Christ as their Savior? Um, and um, number six says, I'll put it this way, you must, by simple faith, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Simple faith. You've got to take God at his word. Take Jesus at his word. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, As many as received him, that is, received Christ. To receive means to accept. Uh, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So believing on the name of Christ, from that verse, is associated with receiving him. Right. You've got to believe on Christ. You've got to believe on his name. Got to, to believe on his name means you put your faith and trust in him. That's what it means. It just doesn't mean that I believe that he lived. I believe that he died. I believe that he rose again. I mean, the gospel is he, he, Christ died. He was buried. He rose again. So somebody says, you know what? I believe that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus rose again the third day. Am I saved? There's people that repeat what's called the Nicene Creed in the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church and all kinds of churches all across America who say those things, and they're no more saved than the man in the moon. I believe that Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. I believe that Jesus Christ spent three days in the lower parts of the earth. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I believe he rose again on the third day. I believe this, that, and other thing. Are you saved by believing that? Or, or let's say by reciting that every Sunday? Some people are counting on that to get them saved. But they've never personally received Jesus Christ as their Savior. There's mouth and words. Yeah. The Bible says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confesses man's salvation. But that's coming from the heart. So you can repeat a prayer, you can repeat a creed, recite a creed, and yet not be saved. Why? Because even though you believe those things, you have not yet accepted Christ as your personal Savior. So you've never received him. Uh, you've never believed on his name in the sense of doing this. And this is what Bible belief is. Bible belief in Christ is this. I believe in Jesus Christ so much that I am counting on him, relying on him, and depending on him to get me to heaven because of what he did on the cross and nothing else. That's right. Amen. And until you come to that point in your life, you're not saved. Right. Amen. Um, so as many as received him to them, gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Revelation, Revelation 3.20. Now, somebody's going to say something. I know it's out of context. But there's a principle here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Um, now, I understand the context of that, but from a soul-winning standpoint, um, it's as if the Lord is knocking on your heart's door. And he's working, the Holy Spirit's working repentance and conviction in you. And each time he does that, each time he... Uh, he, he uh, uh, tries to get you to come, and he's wooing you to himself. It's as if he's knocking on the door saying, hey, you know, I'm outside the door. Let me in. We sing a song called, Let Jesus Come Into Your Heart. The Bible says that Christ does dwell in our heart by faith. That's right. And so when you get saved, you know what? Christ moves in. He lives within you. Amen. And the Holy Spirit indwells you. But that's also Christ as well. The Bible speaks of Christ indwelling you. And so you've got to yield to him. And to get saved, you're not doing anything. You're just yielding. You're just saying, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. What are you doing? I'm just, I surrender. I yield. I give up. I'm no longer trusting me. I'm no longer trusting my church. I'm no longer trusting my baptism. I'm no longer trusting my good works or my sacraments. I'm no longer trusting this, that. I'm not trusting anything. Lord, I give up. I trust you. You know what happens at that moment? You get saved. You got to put your hand. You got to put your soul in His hands. Um, there's a good. And this may be a good illustration. I don't know, but I'll throw it out there. Um, whenever I've had surgery in the hospital, which I've had about three surgeries, um, and each time I've gone, the first time I went, uh, I'd watched, you know. The TV shows, and I know I know the drill, right? I know the drill. They put you down there, you know, they lay you down, they put the IVs in you, and you're supposed to count from 100 backwards, right? Is that true? Is that right? Mm -hmm. 
And so, and so I told the nurse, I was joking, I said, okay, I said, I said, do I start counting from 100 backwards? She said, you'll never get to 100. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was waking up. <laughs> I thought, wow, that was quick. Yeah. So, uh, so the, since then, I, 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 I've had surgery like three times, I think. Each time they had to put me under anesthesia. And uh, when I get in there, I'm all kind of nervous and stuff. And then I just pray and I say, Lord, if I die, I'm going to heaven anyway. I'm going to go painless if I die in surgery. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so anyway, um, speaking of that, I heard the other day, I, heard the other day I, I was listening to a, reading a sermon by Charles Finney. He was talking about death. And he said this. He said, he, he was talking about the, the soul that dies without Christ is going to spend eternity uh, in hell, and they're going to be dying eternally, dying eternally. Mm. He said, have you ever been around, and he's writing this like in 1850 or 60. He said, have you ever been around somebody that has died? He said, my, my first wife died. It took her 24 hours to die. She was in pain and agony. She was moaning, groaning, even screaming. Why? Because they didn't have anesthesia back then to give these people. So the person died before anesthesia became popularized in, I guess, the mid-1800s or whenever it was. People died in pain and agony. And he said, can you imagine that? He said, he said, it broke my heart. He said, I couldn't stand it. And he said, think about other people that you know that have died. Well, back in those days, people feared death because it was a scary thing. It was painful. It was agonizing. And you really wanted to die as quickly as possible if you were going to die. He said, can you imagine somebody that spends a year dying like that? Or two years dying like that? Or ten years dying like that? How about an eternity dying like that? There's no anesthesia in hell. So you feel the torments and the pains of hell. That's what he's saying. Nowadays, people die. They got morphine. They got all these drugs in them and stuff. Sometimes it doesn't help. But a lot of times it does help. And people die with very minimal pain. They don't go out in eternity screaming in agony. As a matter of fact, if they were to die lost and want to have last words... They'd be so drugged up they couldn't tell you what they felt and what they thought about where they're going. But you read old, you read, you read uh, old uh, uh, last statements of people that died, Christian and non-Christians. They actually said some things before they died. Some of them were going to heaven, and some of them knew they were going to hell. Um, I think it was Volterra who said when he died, "What have I done?" Something like that. This is his last words. But anyway. Um, so, back to this thing here about getting saved. What I was saying was when I, you know, going into surgery, what I would do, I just simply, at some point, I just like, okay, just stop. All right. Just stop. There's nothing you can do. You're not getting up. You're not going anywhere. Just stop. And I just, what I just did, I just put myself in their hands. Right. I just gave up. Amen. When you get saved, what you do, you just stop. And you give up. And the Lord comes in and saves you. You don't do anything. At that point, you have a repentant heart. You also have a believing heart. Amen. But there's no, those are not works. Right. Those aren't doing anything. It's just simply resigning yourself to God. And that's and when you accept Christ, that's what you do. Um, you know what a lot of people are doing? When, when you think about this, Behold, I stand at the door knock illustration. You've seen the picture of the guy. Um, of, of, you know, the representation of Jesus and he's outside with a, you know, the candlelight or something. He's knocking on this guy's door, right? You ever seen that picture? Mm -hmm. Knock on the door. And they always say, notice in the, in the picture, in the drawing, the painting, there's no outside doorknob. So he can't open the door. He has to knock. You have to let him in. And the door handle's on the inside. It's as if God knocks on your heart. The Lord does, but he can't open it. He's not going to force it open. He's not going to break in. You have to open that door. And all you got to do really is just unlock the door, and he can push it open himself. But if you keep that door locked, he, he can't get in. And um, then I saw uh, another drawing that a man did. 
of Christ outside the door knocking. And this one's really very descriptive. And here's this guy. Jesus is outside. He's wanting to come in the door. He's knocking on the door, wanting to come in. And this guy has got, he's got the bureau, the dresser, <laughs> the refrigerator, all of it against the door. He's pushing on it so that Jesus can't come in. That's that, that's that will of man. You know what Jesus said? He said, uh, he said, he said, you know, you will not come to me. You will not. Why is that? Because they're resisting. They're still in rebellion. What you got to do is just get all that junk out of the way and come in. We, gotta, we all got a bunch of junk in here. Self-righteousness, pride, vanity, hatred, jealousies. Uh, you know, uh, we, we might have some uh, some against God or whatever it is, you know. You've got to get rid of all that stuff. Just let it go. Right. Let the Lord save you. Um, the Bible said in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some people will say, well, you know, uh, they can call on the Lord. And, and many people will say calling upon the name of the Lord is not a prayer. I just don't get that. I've, I've read pages and pages to explain why calling upon the name of the Lord has nothing to do with prayer. Well, I go back to Jeremiah 33. Call upon me. What did he say in the Psalm 50? He said, call upon me in the day of trouble and I'll answer you. Right. You tell me that's not a prayer. Back there in Jeremiah, the Lord said, somebody said, call upon me. I can't remember how it goes, but call upon me. That was a prayer. Um, you call upon the name of the Lord. Well, who's the Lord? It's Jesus. You call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and he'll save you. But now it's not just saying the words, right? I mean, it's not just saying the words. It's not repeating a prayer after somebody. Right. Um, maybe you did. And if you did, but at that moment, you gave up <clears throat> and you trusted Christ, you got saved. The prayer didn't save you. Trust in Christ saved you. But... Um, Praying is always a good thing. You can go back and say, you know what, I remember, you can write down by Romans 10, 13, I remember on this day, in this month, in this year, I called upon the Lord. And he said if I would do that, he would save me. Right. And I took him at his word. Right? And so when we say that, we're not, when we say, whoso shall call upon the name of the Lord, use that verse, we're not, some people will, but I'm not. I'm not taking this verse out of context. The context is, you have to understand you're a sinner and need a forgiveness. You have to understand that your works cannot save you. You have to understand that only Christ can save you. You have to understand, understand you have to receive him as your Savior and accept him as your Savior. And then, if you understand all that, and you want to pray a prayer and say, Lord, I realize I'm a sinner, and the best way I know how right now, I'm trusting you to save my soul. I believe God will save you. Because it's not a plan. It's not a formula. It's a spiritual transaction between you and God. And everybody's just a little bit different. Um, and when you hear people give testimonies and stuff like that sometimes, or even some preachers preach, it's as if you don't do it this particular way, you're not saved. If you did it this particular way, right. you didn't get saved. And then it starts making people doubt, well, did I get saved? Because now I'm learning that that verse doesn't even apply to salvation, you know. Um, or, you know, but it can be used as an illustration. So, anyway, um, a lot of people are confused about salvation. They're confused about whether they're saved or not. And they get saved, and then down the road someplace, somebody preaches something, and they think, well, I don't think, did I repent enough? On some side, when some people's like this, you didn't repent enough to get saved. <laughs> Other side is, you repented too much to get saved. You didn't even have to repent. So you didn't have to repent, or you repented too much. And then you're like, well, what did I do? What did I do? I, okay, do I repent or not repent? Oh, what did I do? You, know. uh, you didn't believe right. You didn't, hey, you didn't say the right words when you prayed. Right. Oh, I got that one time. I was like, man, I, said, I was under preaching that was making me doubt my salvation. I thought, well, did I pray the right thing? Some people say, well, the prayer, you, you prayed, you didn't even get saved. Others say, well, if you prayed, you better sure, be sure you prayed the right words, exactly. or you didn't get saved. With the heart, Amen. man believes unto righteousness. Amen. With the heart, man, you're saved by your heart when you, when, when you, by faith, trust Christ as Savior from the heart. Okay? So, so what I did, this is what I did. I'm, I'm, I'm done. 
This is what I did. I did this. I uh, searched high and low. Couldn't find it. The trapped with the prayer in the back that I prayed when I got saved. Couldn't find it. But I knew it was a Billy Graham tract. I couldn't think of the name of it. So I started looking around. I finally found the title. It was How to Have Peace with God by Billy Graham. It's kind of got a bunch of diagrams in it and stuff like that. It was even in the King James Version edition of it. And uh, the back was a prayer. Anyway, I, I, I looked high and low. Finally found it at the Christian bookstore. And God took it home. And I said, yeah, that's what I prayed. It's got the right words in it. Everything. Yeah, I'm okay. I got saved. Amen. I even wrote it down in the back of my Bible so I wouldn't forget it. I lost the track. So if I ever get called and say, no, wait a minute. I prayed on this day. And these are the words that I said. I said the right saying. I said the right words. So I'm saying, you happy for me? Okay, man. So, but anyway, I had to do that because this, the, the preaching I was under made me doubt my salvation uh, because I didn't say the right words or I didn't repent enough or I didn't do this or that or whatever. You know what? If you know Christ, if you know you're a sinner, that Christ died for you, that your good works can't save you, if you trust Christ, you're saved. Exactly. People ask, people ask this question. They say, well, how, how can I know I'm saved? I can tell you right now. Right now, at this very moment, if you die and went to heaven, and God asked you why should he let you into heaven, uh, then what would you tell him? And this is how I put it. At this very moment, what are you counting on to get you to heaven? Right now. What are you counting on to get you to heaven right now? What are you counting on? I've asked some people. I asked one time a guy that I said, uh, I went through the whole plan of salvation with him. I said, let me ask you a question. He was an older man. He was a mason. And I said, um, what are you counting on right now to get you to heaven? He said, well, I go to church. And I'm a mason. And I do this and I do that. I'm a pretty good person. And this and that, whatever. I said, okay. I said, so those are, that's what you're counting on to get you to heaven? He said, yes. He was a Methodist also. I said, well, you left out something. He said, what? I said, you didn't even mention Jesus Christ. He said, oh, well, him too. Him too? No, it's him alone. Him alone. That guy was lost as a goose, man. Goes to church where they recite the creed, where they believe that Jesus died on the cross for them. But the man had no clue what salvation was about. Jesus Christ was just, wasn't even in the formula for him. And so when I asked somebody that question, I asked them, I said, what do you, when I present the gospel, what are you counting on? And that'll tell you right then and there what they're counting on. They're going to tell you. And if they don't mention, they don't say Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ went on the cross for me, or Jesus Christ and his blood, or something similar to that, if they don't say that, then that person is counting on something else to get into heaven, which means they're not saved. And unfortunately, there's a lot of religious people that go to church. That's where they're at. Because they've never had the gospel presented to them in their church properly because the preacher doesn't know he's saved. And the pastor and the minister and the reverend doesn't know they're saved. And the priest doesn't know if he's saved or not. I called a Catholic priest here in town one time. I said, uh, I'm doing a survey on what it takes to get to heaven. Um, I said, here's the scenario, if you don't mind. The scenario is I've been diagnosed with an illness. They've told me I've got five minutes to live. Can you tell me how to get to heaven? He said, well, um, I can make an appointment for you in about two weeks. I said, you didn't hear me. I've got five minutes to live. What are you going to tell me how to go to heaven? He said, I told you, mister, you know, I'm booked up. You're going to have to make an appointment with the secretary, and you might, might you know, see in about two weeks. I said, I'll be dead in hell by then. Bother. Man didn't know what to tell me. So he can't tell his people that. That's why they don't know if they're saved or not. So, again, um, it, a lot of religion, you, you take religious people, a lot of them are religious, believe in Jesus, believe the Bible, all these things, but they've never personally received Christ as their Savior. And so they need to do that, or else they are lost and they won't be saved. And so God loves them enough to get the message out to them. And they hear it sometimes every week, but they hear it in such a muddled, garbled uh, way 
that the gospel's not getting through clear and plain. And it needs to. It needs to be plain and clear. And uh, so when you witness to somebody, you want to be as clear and plain as you can with them. And you also want to try to anticipate also some of their arguments or reasonings or excuses and things like that or their, or their misunderstandings. Because many times they can misunderstand what we're saying um, unless we are real clear about our salvation and ask them questions. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Do you understand what the verse is saying? You see what it says. Do you agree with what the Bible says here? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. Do you agree with the part where you got to receive Christ? Well, yeah. Would you like to do that? Yes. And they accept the Lord and they get saved. But then some of them will rebel against that because they're still clinging to their religion. Right. And um, so anyway, so I hope that's helpful this morning.